Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, fellow sheep of him who is the Good Shepherd. My guess is that all of us, whether from personal experience or from seeing something like it on TV or in the movies, knows what it looks like when a jeweler inspects a precious gem. You know that when a precious gem is being uh, studied by an expert, it isn't just a cursory glance that's given to the gem. They put on that, that special jewel-looking jewel, uh, uh, device, that kind of microscope, telescope-looking thing, and they hold up that gem up to the light and look at it from a whole bunch of different angles, a whole bunch of different perspectives. Because a jeweler knows that the only way that you can really, truly appreciate the value of a precious gem is if you've looked at it from every possible angle. I think that that idea of a jeweler looking at a precious gem from a bunch of different angles helps us understand something about how the Bible works. Of course, the Bible is not so much interested in teaching us what a precious gem is worth. Instead, the Bible is trying to teach us, trying to get into our heads and hearts how much Jesus, our Savior, is worth. And one of the ways that it does that is by presenting Jesus from a whole bunch of different angles, a whole bunch of different perspectives, each one contributing in some unique way to the overall picture that there is nothing and no one more important or more valuable than Christ. Just think about all the different names and titles for Jesus that are included in the scriptures. Each one a little perspective into his person and work. We hear that Jesus is the lamb who was slain. A reminder of his great humility. A humility so great that he even offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And yet he is also the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is all-powerful, almighty. He sits at the right hand of God where he governs all things and all of his enemies one day will be put under his feet and smashed to pieces like pottery. Jesus is called the Word of God. A reminder that if we want to know what God is like, if we want to know what his heart, his attitude toward us is, we should look at Jesus because he is the greatest revelation of God. And we could go on and on and on. So many different titles, so many descriptions of who Jesus is and what he has done, all given so that we might truly appreciate how valuable he is. In these words from Mark chapter 6, we get what is one of the most beloved of those perspectives. We hear Mark call Jesus a shepherd. As he looks at these large crowds who had traveled all the way across the north side of the Sea of Galilee on foot, just so that they might be close to him, just so they might hear what it is he has to say. Mark reminds us that he loves his people as a shepherd loves his sheep. Now, even that picture has a whole bunch of different aspects to it. But there's one in particular that we want to focus on as we meditate on these words for this morning. And that's the idea that as our good shepherd, Jesus is calling us. He is calling us his sheep first with a beautiful invitation, but also with an astonishing promise. Now, look at Mark chapter 6, verse 30, where our text begins. This is what Mark tells us. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Now, to understand this verse, you need to think back to what we talked about last week in our gospel. 
Jesus had sent the 12 apostles two by two out onto a missionary journey. They were supposed to go through all the towns of Galilee proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven was near and that people should repent. Jesus had given them the authority to drive out demons and to anoint the sick with oil and heal them. Well, that mission trip is over and the disciples have come back to Jesus eager to report to him all that they had taught and all that they had accomplished. You can imagine, can't you, what it would be like to have these 12 men vying for Jesus' attention? Let me tell you about what I did in this town and what I heard somebody say when I was here. And one of the other disciples says, oh, that's nothing. Let me tell you about what happened when I was in this town and and the reaction that I got. It's like these disciples are so filled with, with joy at the progress of the kingdom that they're like little children arguing for their parents' attention so they can tell them about their day at school. But what I especially want you to get out of this particular verse is that the disciples are coming back from a time that has been very busy. Very often you and I might be tricked into thinking that the disciples' lives was boring. They were just kind of following Jesus around wherever he went, watching him do all the work. But that wasn't the case at all. When these disciples went out on their mission trip, they were very busy. Maybe the the busiest time of ministry that they had, uh, had participated in up to that point. But not only had they been busy as they were about their mission work, they were coming back to a place that was very busy. For when Jesus sent out the 12, he didn't just stop doing his own mission work. He didn't just find a nice Galilean house to sit back and relax in. He was still doing the amazing ministry that characterized uh, his time on earth. And we know that because when the disciples come back, there is this huge crowd gathered around Jesus. How huge was it? Well, look at verse 31. Then, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat. This crowd was so large and was so demanding of Jesus' time and attention that he and his disciples didn't even have a chance to do the thing that is most basic to staying alive, eating a meal. So the disciples have come from a very busy time and they are coming to a very busy time. And though they do not know it yet, the Lord Jesus does, that they are headed toward a very busy time. If you'll allow me to skip to the end of this lesson, verse 34. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And what comes right after this, the the rest of Mark 6, is the feeding of the 5,000. This is how many people were there. 5,000 men, not even including the women and the children, gathered to hear Jesus preach. So the disciples have been busy, they are busy, and they're going to be busy. Now you tell me, does that sound familiar? For those people who suggest that the Bible is this ancient book that has nothing to say to the 21st century world, Does being busy, having been busy, and going to be busy describe 21st century American life to a T? A lot of times I think we expect the summer to be a a time when we have more free time. And yet somehow it, it turns out that it's just as busy as any other time of year. With all that we have going on, with all that our families have going on, with all the traveling that we're doing, it's so easy without even recognizing it, to become so caught up in the busyness of life that we let the one thing needful, Jesus, and our relationship with him to slip away from us. And so while Jesus' invitation that we're going to meditate on here in just a second was first made to these disciples some two millennia ago, they have much to say to us and to our lives today. 
Well, what is that beautiful invitation that Jesus gives us? That he gives disciples who are beset by busyness. Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Now, before we meditate on what Jesus is really inviting us to do, can we just for a moment take an honest inventory of our own lives? An honest inventory of our own relationship with Jesus and hold ourselves up to this invitation. When Jesus says, come with me, how many times have we obeyed? How many times have you and I set aside time just so that we can be with Jesus? And if you really want to put a, a fine point on it, Think about some activity that you really love to do, some, some hobby that, that absorbs your time. How much time have you spent with Jesus compared to the amount of time that you have spent on that hobby? Jesus says, come with me in this very busy time of life. And yet you and I so often fail to take him up on that invitation. He says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. In the midst of our busy lives, how difficult is it to find a truly quiet place? Because there's always a phone that's going to ring or buzz because somebody texted us. There's, there's always an internet browser ready to surf to the latest and greatest thing. There's always some TV show that we need to catch. There's Always a friend that needs our time and attention. I think it's very easy for us as 21st century Christians to, to fall into a pattern in which we worship Jesus from a distance. We worship Jesus as part of this nameless, faceless crowd called the church. And we never really spend time alone with Jesus, just by ourselves. Just him and me. And you know why that is? You know why it's easier to worship Jesus from a distance as a part of a crowd? Because Jesus is safe if you can keep him over there. Jesus is safe if he doesn't turn his holy eyes on you and on your life. Jesus is safe when you don't have to come to him with all of your sins put on display for him and only him to consider. And yet Jesus says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. Before we consider the impact of, of that invitation, let us just take a moment to confess how rarely that has happened in our own lives. Let us take a moment to remember how many times we have fallen short of seeking Him who sought us, of spending time with Him who is the one thing needful for making Him and His Word the priority in our life that it ought to be. But then having considered and confessed, Let's look at this invitation again in a whole new way. For even though you and I have failed to make Jesus a priority, even though we have allowed the busyness of our life to drown out the voice of our Good Shepherd, even though He has not had the, the position in our hearts that He deserves, still our gracious Savior invites us today to put all of our failures behind us and he says, come to me, to a quiet place, by yourselves. Not so that I can destroy you with judgment and fire. Not so that I can fry you with an almighty lightning bolt. But so that you might have rest. You see, here's the great lie of Satan the great lie of our sinful nature, the great lie of our world, that if we can keep ourselves so busy that we never have to come face to face with the reality of sin, 
that is being in a relationship with a holy God, then we will find rest. But Jesus pulls back the, the veil of those lies and he helps us see the true reality that lies beneath. This is the tremendous promise that Jesus makes to us, his sheep. That when we make time for him and his word, when we go with him by ourselves to a quiet place, we will find rest. Not the kind of rest that comes from not having to go to work for two weeks. Not the kind of rest that comes from being able to sleep in on a Saturday morning. The kind of rest that Jesus talks about is far greater than any of those. For the rest that Jesus speaks about is the true spiritual rest from sin that he has come to this world to win on our behalf. It is the rest that knows that even though I have failed to keep God's law perfectly, there is another who has kept that law perfectly in my place. It's the rest that comes from knowing that when God looks at me, he does not see all of my faults and failures and flaws, but he sees the perfect obedience of Jesus, my Savior, credited to my account. It's the rest of knowing that I am never going to have to suffer because of my sins, even though I deserve it. I will never have to suffer because another has taken that suffering upon himself. When Jesus went to the cross and offered his life as a payment there, the blood that he shed was the suffering that I owed for my sin and that you owed for yours. It's the rest from knowing that God's wrath has been appeased. His anger has been calmed. And there is nothing more for us from heaven but blessing and peace and mercy. It's the rest that comes from knowing that even though because of sin, I am going to die. The rest of knowing that I am going to rise again from death just as Jesus, my Savior, did. It's the rest from the fear of the consequences of sin, not the least of which is the fear of death. It's the rest of knowing that I have a good shepherd who is watching over all my comings and goings, a good shepherd who promises to lead me to the still waters and green pastures of his love and mercy. A good shepherd who promises me that I am going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A good shepherd who so loves me that when he sees me wandering away from his path, he has compassion on me and he teaches me many things in his word. So if this text from Mark chapter 6 is like a jeweler, holding the great diamond of Jesus before our eyes, inviting us to view him as our good shepherd. What is the practical takeaway for our lives today? What is the so what? What does this mean for us and for our lives as we wrestle with Mark 6? Hopefully, it's painfully obvious what the application is. But just in case it isn't, let me say it. Your good shepherd is calling you with a beautiful invitation and with an astounding promise. So take him up on it. Make time each and every day where you can spend time with your good shepherd in word and prayer. And don't just do it from a distance as a nameless, faceless part of the church, but do it personally, individually, so that you might come face to face with him who lived and died and rose again for you. And as you do that, as you make his word a daily part of your life, and as you go to him confessing your sins and receiving his peace and forgiveness, then you will experience this tremendous rest. Then you will be equipped for every good work that he has prepared in advance for you to do then you will be strengthened to go another day as you wait for his eternal call 
to the perfect peace and rest that is heaven. In short, you have a good shepherd. You have Jesus. So take him up on his beautiful invitation and enjoy his astounding promise. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus, our good shepherd. Amen.